In this video, I'll take you on a journey painting my first fantasy miniature. I learned a lot of new tricks to add to my toolbox, and maybe some of that will be useful to you. But before the video begins, I can see that just a fraction of my viewers are subscribed. So, go ahead and subscribe. It's free, and you can always change your mind and unsubscribe later, if you want. Hello and welcome back. I'd also like to welcome all you new subscribers and anybody visiting the channel for the first time. It's been, well, way too long between videos. I've put a lot of time and effort into this piece and the only excuse I have is, well, it, it is what it is. This video will be a little longer than normal. I have a lot to share with you guys. And as a result, I've had to speed up some of the video segments. Or this video would have ended up being like three hours long. To start, I'm laying in some thin washes over a pre-shaded base layer. This helps establish a starting point and a directional flow for the following steps. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to continue with my voiceovers. I know I said in a previous video that I wouldn't be doing this anymore because it just takes too much time, but I really feel that the voiceover helps the video and helps you guys understand my process a little better. So, even though it's taking me more time, that's what I'm going to stick to. The painting process I've been experimenting with involves a lot of thin layers of paint. To some, it might seem monotonous and time consuming, but I really feel to get those really smooth blends and tasty transitions, this seems to be the way to do it, at least for me. I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. There are many styles and many ways of making a figure come to life and more than likely I'll change my style down the road. As an artist you should always be open to any type of style or technique. As they say, if you're not evolving, well you're probably dead. Take notice of how the pre-shade is still present. That pre-shade is what gives you a road map and helps you with defining all the shadows and highlights on your figure. I'm really in an experimental stage with acrylic paints. I'm used to oil paints and that's usually what I like to use. But, like I said, always trying to evolve, always trying new things. I'm a sucker for punishment. What can I say? The techniques I'm using here are mainly glazes, washes, and blending. Many of you have asked, what's the difference between a wash and a glaze? The simplest way I can explain it is a glaze will be a paint you want to put over a surface to tone it, to maybe shift the color from a red to an orange. The consistency of the glaze should be roughly 70 to 90% water to paint. And a wash is usually about a 50-50 mix which is used to accentuate raised detail essentially. This is a basic explanation but they can be altered in many different ways. What I'm hoping to achieve with this piece is the effect of sun coming up from the right hand side on the figure and the wolf, well and the building for that matter. This technique is called OSL or outsource lighting. This technique can really add a lot of excitement and drama to a piece. So in the end hopefully I'll have achieved something like that. To achieve this effect, well, you always have to 
pit light against dark. This is something I've talked a lot about in my videos. You need contrast on a miniature to make it effective. And contrast is the key. Contrast is only one element. Other things to consider are color choice, tone, saturation, desaturation, many different things that really help bring your miniatures to life. Here's a good example of light against dark. On the wolf's face, you can see I've got a lot of dark tones, various shades, and then I'm pulling out a lot of the detail with some controlled highlighting. I'm adding darker tones here, trying to recover some of that darkness that might have been lost while creating those light areas. Then blending it all together with a heavily thin version of the same tone. In this step, I'm introducing a little more color into the fur. This helps with the color intensity and drops back some of the desaturation. So what is desaturation and saturation? Saturation refers to the intensity or purity of the color. It represents the degree to which a color appears vibrant, vivid, or diluted. A highly saturated color is rich and intense, while a desaturated color is muted or closer to gray. And there's your official explanation from Google. Hopefully that makes sense. But if you have any other questions, you can always ask me down in the comments section below. Now another technique that I use quite a bit myself is dry brushing. There's absolutely nothing wrong with dry brushing. You just need to know how to use it in the right way. And the best way I've found is to, every time you add your dry brushing, put a thin glaze over top. That helps to knock back some of the harshness and intensity of that dry brushing. Dry brushing is especially effective on items like fur or hair where there's a lot of texture. The key to effective dry brushing is to not just use white, use a variety of different colors, obviously a shade lighter than what you're putting it on, but that's the way to make effective dry brushing look natural. Look how effective strategically placed dry brushing can be. Here you can see all those textures and details really coming to life. This is a glaze and it's something we talked about earlier in the video. By applying this blue glaze, you can see how I've altered the shade, giving the shadowed side a more greenish hue. And this is exactly what a glaze is for. And now, back to something I am more familiar with. Oils are fantastic for washes. In my opinion, oils give you a much better result when painting deep shadows. Indigo and Payne's Gray are a great choice for this application. Oils offer a much longer working time, which makes blending Super easy. And for those really deep shadows, I like to use the oil at about 80% paint to thinner.
You can also use multiple colors in your shadowed areas. This can add a lot of dramatic effect and interest. If you're having trouble with your washes going glossy, I would suggest this AK Matte Thinner. I've been getting really good results from it. I also use dry brushing to blend the transitional areas, especially on hair and fur. Here I'm trying to imply that there's an external light source coming from the left hand side. That's the reason for the left side being brighter than the right side. By adding specific detail painting, this should help sell the effect. I hope, anyway. Dry brushing was also used to help define all the strapping detail on the saddle. So far I've been pretty happy with the AK 3rd gen paints. The quality and consistency of each bottle is really quite good. Again having that pre-shade or xenophal highlight as it's also known gives you everything you need to know when placing your highlights and shadows. I'm pretty much using all the same techniques I used on the Wolf, although you need to be a lot more careful when blending to get those nice smooth transitions, as we're dealing with skin as opposed to hair or fur. When working with oils, I generally work dark to light, but because I'm working in acrylics and they dry so quickly, I find I can jump back and forth between lights and dark without the fear of things getting too muddy. Another added bonus of working in acrylics is you can work multiple areas up rather quickly, working layer upon layer without the fear of anything lifting. In all honesty, there are advantages and disadvantages to working in oils or acrylics. You just kind of have to find what works for you the best. Myself, I enjoy working in both mediums. Each have their own unique qualities, yet I'm always trying to achieve the same results from both. So that's the real challenge I suppose.
like I said before adding dry brushing and then putting glazes over top really helps to smooth those transitions out if you haven't tried this technique yet go ahead and give it a go I really think that you'll be happy with the results After painting the coat a purple color, I wasn't really happy with where it was going. I thought it maybe clashed a little too much. So I decided to change it to a blue shade. I think it was the right choice. The blue just helps to tie things together better, in my opinion. This is another example of how a glaze helps tie all those transitions together. I can't emphasize enough what a really great technique this is. I'm really considering doing some separate videos showing all the different glazing and blending techniques that you can achieve with acrylic paints. Maybe a few tips and techniques videos, you know, 10 minutes long, something like that. Let me know in the comments down below if that's something you guys would like to see. When combining colors, it does help to know a little bit about color theory, but if you don't really know color theory, I would suggest getting some books on the subject or even getting yourself a simple color wheel which you can find on the internet. I did do a book review a few months back and it's chock full of all sorts of things like everything I've been talking about in this video. If you're interested in checking this review out, I'll leave a link in the upper right hand corner of your screen. You can click on that and check that video out if you're into filling your brain with boatloads of quality information. Wet and wet blending was something else I was playing around with a lot on this figure. It's great for creating really smooth transitions between colors. For example, like here on the hair. For me, one of the best parts about painting fantasy miniatures is, well, you don't have to follow any historical rules. Goblins are pretty wacky characters, so they probably would pick a tie-dyed type of hairstyle. And I doubt there's any historical information to prove me wrong on this one.
If you're nervous about painting freehand like I was here on this shield, I found the best way to go about it was to use a very thin consistency of paint, as well using a light tone of paint like white or buff. By doing this, it'll be a lot easier to remove any mistakes. If you're super concerned about really screwing up one of your pieces by trying this, I have an even easier foolproof way of transferring your designs, and that's coming up later in the video, so keep on watching. Once you've established the correct look of the graphic, it's just a matter of filling it in with a few extra layers of paint. All that's needed next is to fill in the appropriate colors and you're good to go. Wet and wet blending works great on feathers as well. You can also use a glaze for brightening or darkening certain areas. Here I'm using a yellow tinted glaze to brighten the front of the shield. I really wanted to try my hand at non-metallic metal and the blade of this spear was the perfect choice. Painting something metal without using metallic paints is not an easy task. The easiest way to do it I find is to go online and search up how to paint non-metallic metal. You'll find hundreds of great examples to use as reference. Understanding light and color theory certainly does make things easier. But definitely don't let this stop you from giving this technique a try. I've also seen many books that you can purchase specifically on non-metallic metal techniques. And that probably would be your best bet if you really want to learn how to paint it properly. One rule that you should always follow when painting non-metallic metal surfaces is there must be a light side and a dark side for this technique to work. Everything else is just messing around until it looks right. Well, maybe not quite that easy. Goblins are probably not the most careful with their equipment, so I'd imagine their blades probably wouldn't have the highest sheen on them. Even so, I still wanted to imply that it was a reflective surface. I found that laying out the highest points of light first helped me decide where to place some of the other colors. Here I've laid in some yellow and brown to imply a reflection from the ground, just like I described earlier in the video. Here I'm adding the sky's reflection at the top of the blade. I'm quite happy with the way this turned out considering this was my first attempt at this technique. I hope this explanation was informative. If you do decide to try this, let me know how you made out.
If you're having trouble getting nice smooth coats of paint, I would suggest thinning your paint about 50% and putting on two to three coats. This will ensure a nice, even, smooth coat. I guarantee you'll have much better results. Here's where understanding color theory really helps. For instance, when I'm painting this yellow flag, if I add red to the shadowed side, it will alter the yellow, giving me more of an orange hue and a warmer tone. If I added blue, it would give me more of a green hue and a cooler tone. And I decided to do just that. I wanted this side to be a little cooler and maybe a little more greenish, so I added a little blue, which shifts everything to a cooler tone. The shadows were built up over multiple layers and again because acrylic dries so fast you can get things done rather quickly. I picked up a few of these GW contrast paints mainly to see what all the fuss was about and I have to say that I'm quite impressed with the results I've been able to get from them. I find a lot of products are well kind of gimmicky but I really think these contrast paints hit the mark. And I think I may pick up some of the brighter colors they have to offer. Here I'm applying some yellow and blue glazing. This will help fade the transition between the two colors. Here I'm using more of a stippling type of transitional effect. It's also a very effective way of blending different colors and areas together. If you recall, I mentioned earlier of a foolproof way of transferring your design to various surfaces. Well, this is it. You simply use these watercolor pencils exactly the same way you'd use acrylic paint. It's really the safest way to do this without having to worry about ruining the piece you're working on. If you screw up and you don't like what you've done, you simply remove the area with clean water and redo the affected area. The watercolor pencil won't stain the area or leave any kind of residue then you just simply apply your chosen color and done. As a final step, I'm just bumping up all the shadows with some blues and reds and that's going to pretty much finish off this banner. Hey, if you dig what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, hit the bell notification and hit the like button if you'd be so kind. It really does help the channel get a little love from the YouTube algorithm. Hey, if you're part of the cool crowd and you watch to the end, 
I really appreciate it. See you soon.